Welcome. Welcome to Tolman's um, celebration. In fact, we heard this morning how uh, his um, leading of the, the non-signers, faculty non-signers, met in this building every Friday um, during, during the fight. So this is particularly poignant that we're, we were able to meet in the morning in Tolman Hall and in the afternoon in, in the faculty club. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce the afternoon session now on the cognitive map and where it has come since Tolman coined the phrase and, and started the whole field, um, started the ball rolling in the 19, uh, 1947. Um, our first speaker is um, Lynn Nadell. And um, Lynn is a, a, a wonderful, I'm so glad he could come and, and introduce um, this, this session today. Lynn knows where to go get educated. He, he first, the first thing um, you need to do if you want to make a big impact in this field is grow up in New York City. But then do all your degrees, MA, uh, B, um, BA, MA, PhD at McGill, hanging out with the like of Donald Hebb and Brenda Milner. Then go to swinging London for seven years in the 1970s. But while you're there, hang out with your, um, your pal John O'Keefe, who is discovering hippocampal place cells. Write a book-length manifesto, The Hippocampus is a Cognitive Map, which for the first time solves two huge problems in um, neuroscience. One, how the brain makes a map, and two, what the hippocampus actually does. Continue on interesting academic peregr peregrinations through Dalhousie, Toronto, San Diego, Irvine, and finally settle down as Regents Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Science, Director of the Cognition and Neural Systems Program, University of Arizona. While serving as department chair and currently as chair of all university faculty, don't forget to collect more awards for your work on the development of memory, on Down syndrome, and to knock out another transformational theory, this time with Morris Mos Moscovich, on the multiple trace theory of human memory consolidations. Please join me in welcoming Linda Dell. Thank you, uh, and I, I have to call her Lucy. I mean, apparently everyone calls her Lucia now, but <laughs> it's always been Lucy. Thank you very much, Lucy, for inviting me to this. This is really a very meaningful meeting for me, uh, and I was happy to be able to come at this, at, at this point. Um, I teach the history of psych, and I teach a variety of classes, and every time I introduce uh, the issue of Tolman, I start by talking about his politics. I mean, it doesn't start with what he said about cognitive maps. For me, it starts with what an amazing person this was. So for me, this, this really is a, a personally rewarding moment to be able to stand here in this faculty club where he led the revolt uh, on this campus and to be able to contribute to this. So thank you for that. So I'm going to be very brief. I'm just here to, to do a brief introduction and make a few small points. Uh, well, maybe not so small, but smallish. And I'm going to be repeating a few of the things that, that, uh, that, that Dr. Dewsbury mentioned earlier in the day for those of you who were at the, at the morning session. But it starts with this observation, uh, one of the observations that Tolman made. Uh, this is a quote from that famous psych review paper in 1948. Uh, but the, point, the few points I want to make uh, really are about the fact that actually there was more than just the notion that there are cognitive maps in the brain. And a bunch of those ideas came out this morning, but I want to highlight a few of them because they're very important for the theory that O'Keefe and I then developed and for the sort of the way the rest of the field perhaps uh, continued. So one point that, that uh, Tolman mentioned about when he brought up the notion of cognitive maps, and this was already mentioned earlier today. Can you hear me back there? Good. Uh, was the notion that these maps may actually come in multiple scales, right? There's narrow strip map, there's a comprehensive broad map. That idea that there are kind of different grains of mapping is, a, is an important idea. That Actually, we now know that there's data to support that idea. I don't know if Edvard's going to say anything about that in particular, but, but this general idea has survived, and it's an important idea. Not just that there are maps, but there are different kind of kinds of maps, right? Second thing, he also wrote a very famous paper called There's More Than One Kind of Learning. And he championed the idea, and this came out in the place versus response controversy that we heard about today. He championed the idea that there were different kinds of learning. But what happened then, historically what happened then, was that Frank Russell came up with a solution to the problem of 
that there are different kinds of learning, that places, place learning and response learning, according to Russell's solution, were not actually that different. It was just that the animal was using different kinds of cues. There was nothing fundamentally different about them. They just depended upon different cues. That was not what Tolman was saying. What Tolman said was that there were different kinds of learning that supported different sorts of behavioral strategies and hypotheses, and that these things might actually have different properties. That was an important point that got lost with Russell's solution. But Russell's solution, I think it was a 57 paper, is that right? You might remember. It was something in the, in the 50s. That kind of put the story to bed for a while. So people stopped arguing about is it place learning versus response learning, and they sort of decided it doesn't matter. It's just a question of what kind of cues they're learning. Now we know that's absolutely wrong, that those two kinds of learning depend upon very different brain systems with rather different properties. They interact, of course. They're all part of the same brain. They may compete with each other. They may, they may uh, cooperate with each other, but they're different. And they have different properties. So that was a very important insight on Tolman's point, on Tolman's part, Russell's so-called solution. Another point that came up this morning. So, so Tolman was very interested and, and was one of the first to demonstrate this notion of latent learning. And here, the key point here was the big debate in the 1950s about the role of reward in learning and whether or not learning could happen in the absence of reward and reinforcement. And the discovery in the late 40s, early 50s, not discovery is the wrong word, but the demonstration that Curiosity and exploration can motivate animals to do stuff. You don't have to give them rewards, you can just give them access to something novel. And, and Tolman then focused on the fact that animals will learn about the environment in the absence of any extrinsic motivation, in the absence of any, or sorry, intrinsic motivation. No, they don't have to be hungry, they don't have to be thirsty. They do need to be those things perhaps to show you that they've learned, but they don't need to be, they don't need to be like that to actually learn. And, and this came out this morning in some of the experiments on latent learning. So here again, Tolman was focusing on the role of curiosity and exploration, which most psychologists at that point were saying was unimportant. Finally, there was this point about means and readiness, this sort of size significant, the notion, but what, what, what was buried in this idea was that Tolman was trying to get to the, to, the, to, to the concept of expectation. How do animals, animals seem to show you that they are expecting something when they, and the Tinklepaw experiment, love that name. I always tell my students about that. It's one of the great experiments simply because of the name of the experimenter. Uh, that Tinklepaw experiment showed quite profoundly that those, and it was, Talked about this morning, but basically, chimp is trained. I, I'm, I'm going to give you a very short version of it. Uh, a monkey is trained uh, for a reward of bananas, and then after getting these bananas, is suddenly given some lettuce and is pretty upset. Right? There was, it was a better controlled experiment than that, but that's the point. Showing that that animal was expecting bananas. Right? It wasn't just good enough to give it some food. It actually had a specific expectation of something. So those expectations mean that the brain is a kind of a predictor. It's predicting what is going to be happening. That, of course, we now, you can't open up a neuroscience book now without seeing the predictive brain all over the place. But Tolman was one of the first to point out how important this was, that animals are engaging in constant predictions and expectations being generated out of these maps that they have built up. Right, so those four ideas are what leads to what, essentially. Before, before I say any, uh, two words about how those ideas became the basis of, uh, of the book that O'Keefe and I wrote, I just wanted to again point out, and this came out this, this morning, that there was in Tolman this clear connection between science and politics. So when he talked about these narrow strip maps and broad comprehensive maps, this was almost shorthand for him, I think, to say narrow-minded people versus broad-minded people, right? And that there are circumstances, you know, brain damage being one thing and, and, you know, drugs and all that other being another, but stress, emotion, frustration, the things that Lucy was pointing out, all of those things can actually shift the brain so that it is, you might say, behaving more on the basis of a narrow strip map than on the basis of a comprehensive broad map. And that, and we now know, there's now good data to show exactly how that happens, that stress that the hippocampus is loaded with stress receptors and stress can kind of selectively downregulate the hippocampus and leave other structures in, in, in charge of behavior and those other structures are more, you might say, survival oriented and less exploration curiosity oriented, narrow your focus, stay alive, and so on. So again, Tolman was onto something very important here, onto the differences between these sort of brain states that legitimate different forms of behavior. Right? So all four of those kind of notions, including this one, and 
one thing I do want to point out, this right here. See this by an overdose of repetitions on the original? This, what he's saying here is that when you overtrain an animal, it, starts, it becomes a Hullian stimulus response animal. And we now know that that's true, and we now know the, the, the neuroscience behind that when you overtrain animals, that the striatum begins to take over control of the behavior. There's a whole raft of, of experiments buried in that idea. So this quote alone probably has six or seven PhD dissertations you know, buried in it, or could have, probably did. All right, so this was the book that O'Keefe and I wrote in 78, which sort of built on, and it had a couple of key concepts. Amongst the key concepts was this one. Of course, this book was, was, was written based on the discovery by O'Keefe of play cells, right? And it was that discovery that sort of triggered, you know, our thinking about this theory that led to all of the other work and everything that's come since then, I would say. So, well, not everything, but, you know, <laughs> the spatial story, so to speak. So the, the four key concepts in the book. The first one in the title is that it's all about cognitive maps, and these are a special kind of spatial system, right? Second key thing, that the mapping system was one kind of memory system responsible for one specific kind of information and that multiple memory systems support various behaviors. That's a misprint there, various behavioral strategies. So this again builds on Tolman's idea that there was more than one kind of learning and we really insisted on this notion that these different kinds of learning have different properties and that those different properties help us understand what you see when an animal has damage to the hippocampus or when a person has damage to the hippocampus. Third point, we said very, very explicitly, maps are created during exploration. So we bought completely into Tolman's insistence that these cognitive maps, that what is the reward for an animal in generating a cognitive map was finding out about the world. It was not food, it was not water, it was not safety, although all of those things you might find out about in exploring the world, but those were not the motivations in any simple sense. It was simple curiosity to map the environment and exploration was a key. So in the book, a chapter on exploration was the first chapter in, in discussing the actual data about the effects of hippocampal lesions. All right? And finally, that maps enable flexible behavior. We made the argument that if you have a map, just like if you have a map of San Francisco, it doesn't tell you, you know, where you are. It simply tells you if you're here and you want to get there, this is what you do. Right? So a map, is, a map sort of enables flexibility in behavior because it's such a rich information base, rather than just, if I'm here, turn left at the corner. That was going to get you to where you'd get to if you turned left, but it's not going to tell you anything more than that. So those were the four ideas, or some of the main ideas conceptually in the book. I'm leaving, a, I mean, I'm not talking now about the physiology, the play cells. These were the sort of theoretical conceptual ideas. And the point is, each one of those is one of the ideas that, here's Tolman's idea, and how, here's how it maps onto the things that we said. So this really, we really did build extensively on Tolman's thinking, not only about the idea of a cognitive map, but about the properties of cognitive maps, about the properties of place learning, and how that informs behavior. So, I will close. I'm staying on time, I think. We made a variety of predictions in the book. Uh, one of those predictions was if this thing was really a cognitive map, then not only would it need the place cells that O'Keefe and Dostrovsky had described, but it would also need something that conveyed information about direction and distance at a minimum if it was going to function like a map. So there was built into this the prediction that sooner or later somebody's going to find cells that provide direction information, and those, the head direction cells came... When did Ronk discover the head direction cells? 80, the mid-80s, and then the final, and in many ways, the cement piece, the grid cells that, uh, that Edvard and Maybrit Moza discovered. And, and so you're going to hear about those and hear that aspect of the story from Edvard as soon as I get out of, well, not as soon as I get out of the way, because the first talk by David Foster will be about this issue, about the hippocampus generating predictions. Uh, and th we talked about that in the book for the reasons I described, and, but again, we didn't know anything about the mechanisms, even though actually John was, I believe, the first person to notice the ripples, uh, and I think there was a, there's a mention in the book about the ripples, uh, but we had no idea what they were, right? And now we understand that there are mechanisms in hippocampal activity that have to do with what's actually going on when an animal is predicting, what if I go down this road, what am I going to see, and so on and so forth. So that talk, now let's finish this.
so David Foster will tell you more about that particular part of the story. So with that introduction to kind of where, sort of how O'Keefe and I built on the cognitive map story and then lots of other really exciting things happen and we're gonna hear about those exciting things now from people who have actually done the work. So I'm gonna get out of the way and let you introduce David.